hear me. I have about three, four chairs over here. Going to be the MO for what we're doing here for a few weeks. 
and you'll see the four main sections that we are going to be studying. Uh, the first one, and this is what we'll be dealing with tonight, it deals with scriptural doctrine pertaining to the millennial kingdom. That's what we deal with tonight. And next week we talk about the governance of the millennial kingdom. Oftentimes, and what I mean by that is, uh, oftentimes people will say, well, well, who's going to be ruling and reigning in the millennial kingdom? And, and what is the form of government? And how will people be responding? Those types of questions will be answered uh, next week when we come together. And then we're going to talk about worshiping God in the millennial kingdom. And with that, we'll talk about things like the sacrificial system, uh, kind of an interesting aspect to the millennial kingdom. And then the last is the living and resurrected saints in the millennial kingdom, talking about who is there and what it's like and how do they deal with wickedness uh, when someone's sitting in the millennial kingdom, and we'll kind of flush that out. So let me just say this as a way of introduction. There are hundreds and hundreds of Old Testament prophecies that are fulfilled here uh, with the Millennial Kingdom. And there are many, many passages in the Bible that pertain to the Millennial Kingdom. Uh, you can't read through uh, a, a book like one of the major prophets, for instance, without intersecting some very important teaching on the Millennial Kingdom. You also can't go through the Gospels without getting into the Millennial Kingdom and Kingdom, what we would refer to as Kingdom passages. So when Jesus is teaching, it's important for us to be able to kind of apprehend uh, who his audience is and what is the... Uh, design uh, of the passage, what is the main point that he is trying to convey. So uh, when we talk about Jesus and we talk about his teachings, uh, we'll, we'll be trying to apply those in a way that we can understand it and uh, categorize it. You can write notes in your Bible if you like to write notes in your Bible and you can write right in there a kingdom passage uh, so that you know when you're reading it later, hey, this is a kingdom passage. I remember that. Um, but looking at uh, all the things that God's Word has for us, it's uh, pretty amazing. In Jeremiah chapter 23, uh, and verses 5 and 6, it says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. He will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is his name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteousness. Well, we're never going to exhaust all of the things that pertain uh, to the kingdom in this study. But we're going to try to put a dent in it. How's that? <laughs> we'll try our best. I want to just back this up to the beginning. Take your Bibles with me, and, and let's all look at Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. The kingdom and the teaching on the kingdom of God uh, is something that is very, uh, very much at the beginning of the Gospels. In Luke chapter 1, we come to verse 31, and it's talking here about Jesus, and this is Jesus' birth being foretold. And it says, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He'll be great, he'll be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Well, that's a, a neat passage of scripture, and it's right there at the very beginning uh, of what the Bible begins to talk about and starts speaking about here, uh, the kingdom of God. Flip over with me to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, oftentimes uh, this is a passage I think that was somewhat misunderstood. And if you happen to have a King James Bible and you're reading that, it will lend itself to misunderstanding. And I preached for many, many years with the King James Bible, and I memorized the scripture from it. So I do love it. But there are times when it'll turn you sideways, so you've got to watch. But this is what Jesus says here in this passage. He says, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. Nor will they say, look here, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. 
Now, when you read that, you begin to understand that the kingdom of God in your midst is speaking about who? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is right there with you. You don't need to look for more signs. You don't need to uh, go out in, in the highways and byways and try to figure it out. And if someone over here says, look, we think we found him, and he's down here at the Sea of Galilee, and it's not Jesus, it's not him, or, oh, look, over here in Petra, or down in Egypt we heard about. No, Jesus says to these I am right here, and I am in your midst. The King James that I was just picking on says the kingdom of God is within you. And it's a poor translation there. And if you read it and it says it's within you, you would think that it's speaking of Christ dwelling within the hearts of believers. And you would say to yourself, oh, it's Jesus. He's speaking only about a spiritual kingdom. But what we find here is that Jesus is actually... Uh, offering a truly physical kingdom. I loved it when I was in seminary. They used to debate, uh, have these great debates over whether or not Jesus actually offered the kingdom uh, or not. Uh, and uh, they went round and round with that. I mean, round and round. And uh, it was kind of like, well, if he offered the kingdom and uh, they rejected him, uh, then could he really offer it if with his foreknowledge he knew that they were going to reject it? And so was it really a legitimate offer? <laughs> That's the kind of stuff you can just drive yourself nuts with. And uh, I, I really have never really had too much time for that. Uh, do I believe that Jesus was offering the kingdom? I would say that I believe that he was offering the kingdom. I believe that that's a, a reference here in verse 21, that he was saying, yes, the kingdom of God is right here. I am right here in your midst. Now, Jesus, God, knows what the future is. And he would know that they were going to reject him. But still, that doesn't nullify the fact that he makes that offer. Because you'd say to yourself, and you'd be correct in saying, well, if they had accepted him and embraced him as their Messiah, then he would not have needed to go to the cross. And if he didn't go to the cross, then what would be our situation? And our situation would be, we're all on our way to hell. So God knew that they were going to reject Jesus. This was already before the foundations of the world stuff, right? I mean, this, is, this goes way back. And yet, I truly believe that the offer is legitimate. I believe it's legitimate. However, I do believe that he knew of it, and he knew that they were going to reject him. Now, there comes a turning point in Jesus' ministry where Jesus uh, withdraws the kingdom offer. And that happens in Matthew. And if you turn to your Bible uh, to Matthew chapter 12, these are all uh, notes before we get on to the actual syllabi or the, the note sheet. So you'll want to write this stuff down. This is good stuff. I always believe in eating the eating the frosting first. You know what I mean? <laughs> why, why, why waste any time? I mean, the, the rapture is right around the corner. It could happen before you get to the, the rest of the meal. And so you might miss a dessert, and that would be tragic, right? right. <laughs> Seriously. All right. In Matthew chapter 12. This is a pivotal point in the Lord's ministry here. Uh, one commentator said, it's the great turning point in this gospel with the offer of our Lord to Israel as their king as well as the offer of the kingdom here ceasing. Um, well noted, because in chapter 12, notice word verses 14 and 15 there. It says here uh, that uh, the Pharisees went out and conspired against him as to how they might destroy him. And Jesus was aware of this. He withdrew from there. And that is a key point there when it talks about him withdrawing himself from there. And that is a tremendously sad commentary on the people of Israel. So the, the, the Lord is rejected by the nation, and he announces the severance of this, this natural tie the tie whereby he is really bound to the people of Israel. And you see this uh, in Jesus' is, is wording here, verse 40 um, in Matthew chapter 12. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men and men of will stand up with this generation at the judgment. 
and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up. Now, who's greater than Jonah? Jesus, right? And so the queen of the south will rise up in this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because she came to the end of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Now, when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through the waterless places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it unoccupied, swept, and put in order. And it goes and it takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and they live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. That is the way it will also be with this evil generation. And so from this point on, you have the condemnation that is coming from Jesus' lips upon these people. And in the Lord's public ministry, there's almost a progression of announcements that are taking place that are asserting that this, with, uh, this withdrawal of the offer is taking place. Um, there's the woes that are pronounced on the leaders uh, of the nation in Matthew chapter 23. Uh, o Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stoned them who sent to thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen gathered? Do you remember that passage? And, and also Luke chapter 19. If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thy eyes, for the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in you one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Luke 21, Jerusalem will be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Matthew 21, verse 42. The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. That's Matthew 21, 42 and 43. And what's that speaking thereof? I believe it's speaking here when it talks about this nation as a reference to the Gentiles. Uh, it, it, some think maybe something else, but most people would agree with that statement that it's a reference to the Gentiles. And, and so there has been uh, communication from God to the people of Israel uh, during this time where this evil generation uh, is there. God allows for them to repent, and they refuse to do so. And this has been really the track record of the people of Israel for a very long period of time. God sends his prophets. Jesus gave illustration of that. I, I, I sent the prophets. The prophets came and you killed them. And then now, and he gives the illustration in the parable, and then the owner's son shows up, and you did the same thing. And so every opportunity has been taken uh, to allow the people of Israel to be blessed and to experience the <coughs> tremendous promises that God had given to them, and yet they come and they reject it. So it's a, a difficult time. But God, who is so amazing with all of his promises, is going to have a future fulfillment. And that future fulfillment is yet future to us, and it's not too far away in all likelihood. And it's exciting to think that this is going to be a time when hundreds of Bible prophecies will be absolutely fulfilled. You see, God is true to his word, isn't it? God is always true to his word. And even though we look at things and we don't understand things and we don't um, uh, fully see the, the behind the scenes operations of Almighty God, understand this, that God is not slack concerning his promises as some men count slack. God is going to send Jesus Christ and the second coming of Christ is right around the corner. And that's important for us to know. Now, Let's do a little bit of background and a little bit of review. Take your Bibles, let's go to Daniel, and let's go to the last chapter of Daniel. I feel like this is where we left off last summer. <laughs> Daniel chapter 12. And so uh, what I want to do is, I'm never going to get done here tonight. 
Who told you? As long as you can. The Bible says in verse 1, At that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who's found written in the book, will be rescued. So what we find here is a pretty phenomenal passage of prophecy. Starting all the way back there in chapter 9 of Daniel with the 70 weeks, and we had that prophecy that we studied last summer with these, he has continued on talking here about the end times. And at the end time, he says in verse 1, Michael, and we know Michael is whom? Who's that a reference to? Uh, yeah, the, the great angel, right? And so the great mighty angel of God uh, is going to stand guard over some of your people. And uh, that's a wonderful thought. The people of Israel, God still loves the people of Israel. You, you know that? God still loves them. He absolutely does. Um, you go to Israel, they treat you great because you're Christians and you're great tourists. You spend money there, and uh, they want you to, to kind of love them. But make no mistake about it, uh, as far as enemies of the cross go, and the Jewish people, even today, uh, are the number one enemies of Christianity. Uh, they despise Christianity. And uh, they, they despise Jesus. And one day, that is going to change. And it, it's pretty phenomenal when you stop and you think about the, the change of heart. We're going to talk about the change of heart here tonight. We're going to talk about some of the characteristics of the kingdom uh, on a spiritual level. You're going to love it, and I'll show you why. It's just ridiculous how all of these things just work together for good. Um, but here in Daniel chapter 12, there is a time of distress that is enormous upon God's people. These are the people, again, whom God still loves. These are the people who, during the tribulation, when he talks about this time of distress, he's actually speaking here about the time of Jacob's trouble. This is the, the hideous time uh, where the people of Israel will be undergoing uh, such a people in the world whereby the wrath of God is being poured out upon uh, the world because of its wickedness. Now, let me just give you a little timeline so that everybody's on the same page, especially if you weren't here last uh, summer or the summer before that. Uh, those of you who have been here the last two summers, I would expect any one of you to come up here and do a timeline. Absolutely. Um, but we, live, uh, we live in the church age, don't we? What's another uh, name for the church age? All right, age of grace. A couple of you have. And uh, that's been continuing on. It started, and I'm going to put a P here. That's when it started. What, what's the P stand for? Pentecost. Pentecost. And uh, it'll continue until the, the rapture. And I'll put an R here. How's that? So we live in this period of time. We're traveling along that timeline right now. And the next great event for the church will be the rapture. That's an important note. But there is seven years of tribulation that is going to follow the rapture. And the first half, now I'm really good at math. When you take a seven and you divide it in half, and you come up with three and a half. <laughs> Three and a half. And the second three and a half is a time of Jacob's trouble. When does the wrath of God begin to be poured out upon the earth? It begins right after the rapture. But the people of Israel, according to Daniel chapter 9, actually uh, make an agreement, or the Bible describes it as a covenant, with this one world leader who we would understand to be the Antichrist. And there's a three and a half year period of relative peace for the people of Israel. Whereas the rest of the world is experiencing some of the initial judgments that are coming upon 
you know, out of heaven upon the earth. And there are people dying in every, every phase of that. But the Antichrist, who has taken power, uh, is in a peace agreement with the people of Israel for that first three and a half years. At the midpoint of the tribulation, he breaks that peace treaty, and it begins the time of Jacob's trouble. That's the reference here in Daniel chapter 12. So that we understand what's happening here at the very end of the time of Jacob's trouble, at the end of this seven years, uh, we have the second coming of Christ. And the second half of, uh, and that ends the tribulation time. Uh, if you're wondering when the battle of Armageddon is, that's right about at the end of it, right there. And this will then begin the 1,000 year millennial kingdom. And that's what we're going to be spending our time talking about. But what I want to do is just kind of set this up so that we understand uh, a couple of things here moving into that millennial kingdom. Notice here in this same passage here in chapter 12, he's going to tell us uh, that uh, Daniel um, is observing this in his vision. And it says in verse 4, But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth, knowledge will increase. And Daniel looked, and behold, two others were standing. One on this bank of the river, the other on the bank, other than that bank of the river. And one said to the man dressed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, How long will it be until the end of these wonders? And I heard the man dressed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, as he raised his right hand and his left toward heaven, swore by him who lives forever, that it would be for a time, times, and a half time. And as soon as they finished shattering the power of the holy people, holy people are the Jews, all these events will be completed. As for me, I heard but could not understand, so I said, my Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? And so he's telling us for a time, times, and a half the time, this is the period that they're looking at. Time is singular, it's one. Times is plural, it's two. Add those together along with the half, and you come up again with three and a half. Now, what's interesting to me here in this passage is in verse 10, it says, many will be purged, purified, and refined. But the wicked will act wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand. But those who have insight will understand. From the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished, and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. Now that's pretty close if you do the math to three and a half years. And so three and a half years, this is that second half. Again, another reference to the time of, of Jacob's trouble. But notice verse 12, how blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to the 1335 days. So we have here 45 days. 45 days in between what? Well, now we're going to have to redo this, aren't we? We have the second coming of Christ. And then there's 45 days before the millennial kingdom starts. Now in that 45 days, there's a lot to get done. And let me just give you uh, some of the things that, that may be going on during that period of time. First of all, we see here the Antichrist and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire. Now, you want to go back to Revelation 19 with me. I want to show you this. In verse 20 of Revelation 19, it says, The beast was seized, and with him a false prophet, who performed the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast, and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. 
and the rest were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Uh, the reference here, the beast, is, uh, you could better translate that probably creature. The creature, uh, we, we hear about this creature, this beast, uh, that's a reference to the Antichrist. This is the one who came up out of the waters and so forth. This Antichrist is cast into the lake of fire along with the false prophet. Uh, remember, you have the unholy trinity, as it were, where you have the Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan. All three of those. Uh, wreaking havoc during that uh, time of, of seven years of tribulation. And as they take control and, and they have so much uh, power, uh, God is pouring out his, uh, his wrath upon the world. Now, interestingly here, uh, they're cast alive uh, into this lake of fire. They, they are the first people to avail themselves of the lake of fire. Uh, that's kind of an interesting thought. Uh, they are the first people. Uh, up until now, and even during that period of time, uh, when someone dies who is a non-believer, uh, they will go to a place called Hades. And uh, it's that, uh, it was originally that, that shield. Uh, you have, uh, think of the, the, the parable Lazarus and the rich man, where on the one side you have Lazarus, on the other side you have the rich man. Well, when Jesus died and comes forth from the tomb, paradise is now where they are. And so they're out of the realm of the dead. They're with the Lord in paradise. And that's what happens to you and I if we die right now tonight. We'll go be with Jesus, all right? Amen. Now, those who are unbelievers are in Hades. And that's where they are going to remain until the end of the millennial kingdom. It's here that we have the final judgment of the lost. But during this 1,000 year period of time, uh, the demon inspired Antichrist and false prophet will be there in the lake of fire, which is a far worse place. Uh, it's a place where the devil and his angel, that's the creative purpose of the lake of fire, uh, was for those who had fallen. And so this was never the desire of God for any human being to spend a moment in the lake of fire. Uh, but that is exactly where these people are. They've been cast in their alive. God does not destroy them. They're cast in their alive, and they will live there forever. They're forever. And these are human beings, by the way. These are, these are human beings. Yes, energized by Satan, but these are human beings. And uh, as horrific as it is, those who are in Hades will be judged at the great white throne judgment at the end of the millennial kingdom, and then they will be cast into the lake of fire as well. Now, Satan, uh, he's going to be cast into the abyss here in chapter 20. So an angel coming down to heaven holding the key of the abyss, a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the abyss. And he shut it and he sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. And after these things, he must be released for a short time. And we'll talk about that uh, uh, down the road here. And so those, those events are taking place. I believe they take place during this interlude, this 45-day period of time. Uh, something else that's probably taking place here is the judgment of the sheep and goats. Uh, stop and think with me here what this must be like. Jesus Christ comes back the second coming. Uh, we have a remnant of Jewish people who are believers. We have had probably millions of people come to faith in Jesus Christ throughout the entirety of the tribulation. That's not a small thing. That's a huge thing. Especially in light of, I believe, what, what 2 Thessalonians talks about. But here these people have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. They are going to need to be resurrected as well, these believers. But there are people who are alive uh, at the coming of Christ here, 
some of them are believers and some of them are not believers. Michael, the Bible specifically states there in verse 1, has been taking the responsibility of guarding the people of Israel during the tribulation. And so there's a remnant that have been preserved who are alive. And they will go into the millennial kingdom. Now, let me just throw this out there. The church age really pertains to Gentiles and you could say Jews. But as we know, predominantly the number of people who are part of the body of Christ are Gentiles. When you come to the seven year period of time, this is very Jewish. It's for that reason the rapture takes place and the church is gone. This seven year period of time is something that the Bible has been very clearly stating would take place. After this, and we have the second coming of Christ, we have the Millennial Kingdom. Is the Millennial Kingdom more oriented to the Jewish people or to the Gentile people? The Jewish people, right. Hence the hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament that are now fulfilled here. So we see this all, all taking place. The sheep and the goats, uh, that's a judgment. Matthew chapter 25, if you want to look over there. Matthew chapter 25 is a, a kingdom passage. Next summer, uh, when we get into our study next summer, next summer's study is going to be on uh, the material that I was teaching there in China. Um, hermeneutics. How do we interpret the Bible? How do you interpret it? It, it is yes. so practical. It is such a practical study. And I'm really, I'm going to lean heavy on all of our Bible teachers here uh, at Faith to come and be a part of that. Uh, because it really, really is. I, I honestly wouldn't want to teach anything from the Bible without going through that and understanding some of these significances. And so it's really, really helpful. It really is. Some of the things you might say, oh, yeah, I knew that. But I'll guarantee you there's a lot there. Light bulbs will be flashing. And you'll be sitting there going, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And, and things will come together for you so wonderfully. But here we are. We're in Matthew chapter 25. You have to be careful if you come to a passage of Scripture that's a kingdom passage. And you start preaching it and applying it for today. And uh, you don't make any allowances and so forth. So you want to be very, very careful. So looking at this uh, judgment of the sheep and goats, uh, you can see here uh, in verse, let uh, me back this up a little bit, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and the angels with him, then he'll sit in his glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. What would you rather be, a sheep or a goat? Sheep. <laughs> you want to be a sheep because the goats are not going to go into the millennial kingdom. Only the sheep will go into the millennial kingdom, right? right. So that's an important point. So during this interlude, it may very well be that there will be this judgment of the sheep and the goats which will take place. Obviously, that has to take place before the beginning of the millennial kingdom because you aren't going to let people into the millennial kingdom and then kick them out of the millennial kingdom. So uh, this has to be dealt with first. It also may be, and I, I don't know uh, the time frame, what God has in plan here, but the marriage supper of the Lamb is one very important uh, uh, biblical event uh, pertaining more to the body of Christ, and this may very well take place during this interlude uh, as well. I'm sure by then we'll be really hungry, and uh, we'll be looking forward to it. Uh, but uh, I'm already looking forward to it, you know? Uh, most important thing about that meal, by the way, is that you have reservations. Yeah. That's the most important thing. Uh, we won't cut calories at that meal. Everything's going to be fine. But you have to have reservations. And the only way you can get reservations is by faith in Jesus Christ and in Him alone. It's a very important point. The judgment seat of Christ may also take place. If you want a couple of references for the judgment seat of Christ, Romans 14, 10 through, 4, 10 through 12. Uh, references uh, a future time of accounting 
and as well, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10 speaks about that as, as well. The judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is a time when the church will be given awards for what they have done for Christ while we have the opportunity here. And so that's a, a very special time. Significant resurrections uh, leading up to this time are important to understand as well uh, because there's a lot of things that are going on here. There are actually four resurrections. There are four resurrections that we need to talk about. The first resurrection is in 1 Corinthians 15. Does anyone want to guess what is the first resurrection? Anyone? Christ is the first Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Jesus is the first fruits. He is the first in the resurrection program. The second resurrection takes place when? At the time of the rapture. And so let's put down here Jesus' church, the bride of Christ, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Important to know. So, we have here, before Pentecost, we have number one with Jesus' resurrection. Here we have number two, this is at the rapture. When is the third resurrection? And incidentally, all four of these resurrections are known as the first resurrection or the resurrection to life. Okay? This is the, the just, just to be clear then, that second one, the bride of Christ is raptured and the dead in Christ, that's that's the church age that have died in the church age. Exactly. That's everyone, everyone for Pentecost to hear. I've often thought about that. You know, you stop and think about it. So the thief on the cross, it's great that he got saved. Right? I mean, that's just wonderful. But he just misses being part of the church. You know what I mean? And he just misses it. And uh, so where does he go? Uh, Jesus says, you'll paradise. be with me in paradise. So he's there in paradise uh, with Christ. Uh, but when the resurrection happens here, does the thief on the cross get resurrected? Yeah. No. Why not? Why not? Only those who are part of the bride of Christ, the church age, starting at Pentecost, ending there at the rapture, will, and remember at the rapture, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, says the dead in Christ will rise first, and then those who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds. And so we have to understand, this is the church age program, this is the bride of Christ, and you could have, you could have died in God the paradise five minutes before the Holy Spirit came in that room. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? <laughs> and uh, that means you've got to wait to be resurrected. All right? So it's a good thing that time passes really quickly in heaven. So it really won't matter that much to them. I'm just making a federal case out of nothing. I just want you to <laughs> But here, here I, I'm trying to make a point, though, so that you understand that these people here in the church age are the ones who are part of that second resurrection. Okay? So if you died before Pentecost, now, and you had faith in God, faith in God, right? That, that is the one thing that has saved people from the beginning, and it is all that's required to the end. Faith. The object of the faith in the Old Testament is God. My faith in God. Abraham was justified by faith. And his faith, the object of his faith, faith was God. In the New Testament, the object of our faith is Jesus Christ. So we, I have to have faith now, not only in God, but I need to have faith specifically in Jesus Christ. So someone like the Jewish people, for instance, today would say, well, we have faith in God, like Abraham had faith in God, and so we'll go to heaven. And no, you won't, because now you need to have faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus said, no man can come to the Father except it be through me. And so there's no other way. 
uh, aside from Jesus Christ that a person can have eternal life. All those people, going all the way back to Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all of these people, Joshua and so forth, are all waiting to be resurrected. But because this period of time uh, has to come to pass, the resurrection doesn't take place until uh, right here, at this point in time. And so here, I'm guessing within this 45 days, that's when the Old Testament saints are resurrected. The Old Testament saints that are resurrected, the people who missed Pentecost by five minutes will be resurrected. Why is that important? Well, the Old Testament saints, they have a role in the millennial kingdom. They have a role in the millennial kingdom. So it's important for them to be there. We wouldn't want them to miss it, would we? So the reference uh, for that, Daniel chapter 12 is actually the first place that speaks about a future resurrection. And uh, <coughs> I'll read that here for you. He says in verse 2, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Uh, that is uh, the first place that this occurs. Another verse, if you'd like it, is Isaiah chapter 26. And verse 19. So tell me, who is poised at this point to go into the millennial kingdom? We have, tell me the groups. Yeah, believing Jews. I'm going to say the sheep. Right? Ah. Right? Sheep. Remember the sheep and goats. The sheep are going to go into the millennial kingdom. The Old Testament saints are resurrected. And guess where they're going? They're going into the millennial kingdom. Who are we missing? Yeah, the tribulation saints. The tribulation saints. They're up in heaven and they're looking down and they're like, when are we going to get some retribution here for losing our heads, literally? And uh, eventually, uh, they see how God's wrath comes upon an ungodly and wicked world. And we see then that they have the opportunity uh, to, to see uh, actually God at work. Now, if you go back to Revelation chapter 20 again. Revelation chapter 20. I'm going to pick this up here in verse 4. Then I saw thrones. John said, they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus, and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Whew. Now, there's a lot of meat, isn't there? There's a lot of meat. And I want you to go back with me and, and just pull that apart. He says, these are going to be resurrected, come back to life, and they're going to reign with Christ for a thousand years. When do the tribulation saints get resurrected? Right here. That's right. During those 45 days, I believe, that's when they're going to. If I'm, if I'm wrong in reading Daniel, and, it's, and they're not resurrected in those 45 days, it's totally safe to say with absolute assurance that they will be resurrected prior to going into the millennial kingdom. So we have tribulation saints, Old Testament saints, all going in. We have sheep who are also going in. 
And he says here that that, uh, that all of these who have a part in the first resurrection are going to be involved with Christ during the millennial kingdom. You see that there? Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. You're here tonight, and you place faith in Jesus Christ. That's you. Isn't that exciting? I, I think that's exciting. I'm pretty jazzed about that. Blessed and holy. Oh, I mean, you stop and think about it. I mean, we are going to be fully holified by the time this takes place. Because right here at the rapture, our sin nature is gone forever. Now, we could die before that, and it'll be gone forever, too. Either way, we're a win-win situation here, right? And, and then we come uh, and we're presented uh, to Jesus. We're going to be part of the entourage that comes back with Jesus here to this earth. Uh, it's, the Revelation tells us that. And so here we are coming back with Jesus Christ. Can you imagine the grand event that is taking place at that time? That is probably one of the most exciting events of your life. I'm, I'm totally serious. I, I can't even imagine this. I mean, it's just, it is beyond the wildest scope of my wildest imagination. It's beyond the greatest movie ever made. It's, it's just, it is just off the charts. We are going to come back with Jesus Christ. The world is in absolute turmoil. The wrath of God has been poured out upon these people. They're standing there shaking their fists at a holy God. And here we are. Now, we are blameless. Ephesians chapter uh, 5, talking about the court, talking about that whole passage there, talking about the fact that, that we are presented to Christ blameless and holy. Why? Because our sin has been uh, removed. It's, it's expiated. It's gone and our sin is so far gone that now, <coughs> part of the body of Christ, we are presented to the bride of Christ, uh, as the bride of Christ, and here we are with him, holy, coming back. You say, well, what gives us the right uh, to come back? Jesus Christ, in being clothed in the righteousness of Christ, gives us the wherewithal to attend that. And we come back, and when we come back, there are these two enormous resurrections. We've already had our resurrection. We're going to know how cool that is, right? And we're going to sit there and say, wow, this is, this is amazing. This is really amazing. Here's these Old Testament saints, and there's Joshua. There he is, there he is. You know? and, and, and we're going to see all that. That's going to be amazing. And then here are these tribulation saints, people whose heads were cut off because of faith in Christ, because they stood up for the word of God, because they said, no, I'm not taking that mark. I'm not going to do it. And here they are resurrected. Do you think they're going to be an excited bunch, by the way? No, I mean, seriously. You, I mean, they're going to be, whoa, and, and so excited. This is the event that we're going to see. This is what we're going to be standing there when the judgment of the sheep and goats takes place. Pretty, that, that's pretty, like, whoa. And we'll realize that we are there by the grace of God. And we will be so, so thankful. And we are going to, along with the Old Testament saints, the tribulation saints, the Jews that, that fought through those times of the, the last three and a half years, the time of Jacob's trouble, uh, who, who Michael held on to and guarded so that they would live through it, we're going to be with them, and we're going <coughs> to all go marching into that millennial kingdom. That's pretty amazing. So will we be here during the millennial kingdom? Well, you got to come next week. See. <laughs> I'm not giving away anything. <laughs> so, uh, so we're going to be there. Uh, and I hope you're excited about it. I, I just think that's, that, that is, when they tell us, get on the horses, I mean, oh, wow. I mean, you know, I, I'm kind of, a, and I get nervous about roller coasters, you know what I mean? When they go, I, I'm going to be okay with this. I really am. I guess I'm with Jesus. And uh, I, I, he, he said, uh, he's never lost one. <laughs> and I'm banking on that. <laughs> and so we're going to, oh, what a, what a time. So you have these resurrections. So all this taking place during this 45 uh, day period of, of time. Uh, pretty exciting as uh, you stop and we think through. Well, I guess I need to really use those. Okay. <clears throat> oh, yeah, there, it's all in the notes. That would have been helpful. <laughs> <laughs>
All right. So, so now we're ready to start our lesson for tonight. And the lesson is the scriptural doctrine of the millennium. And, and uh, I, I can't go beyond four weeks. I, I, I can't do it. So we're stuck. So, and there's some good stuff here. All right. Talking here about the millennium and the covenants of Israel is an important point to understand because, as I've mentioned to you, uh, there are many, many Old Testament prophecies that have been fulfilled. Well, wow, after the introduction, I should start with another word of prayer. Um, uh, but as you as you look at what has, as you look at what these covenants are all about. Uh, you're reminded again of the faithfulness of the Lord. You see there the Abrahamic covenant. Let me just mention a, a couple things about some of these um, these promises. When God <clears throat> dealt with Abraham, you go back to Genesis, Genesis chapter 12, he gives to them a promise. He gives to him a promise of a national land uh, that was very important. And you can write the scripture down there, Genesis 12, 1 to 3. He gave them a covenant that would be perpetual. This was going to, to continue on. There was a promise of redemption and a promise of numerous descendants. And this covenant determines the entire future program for Israel. And it's a major factor in the doctrine of the last days. So the Abrahamic covenant... God gave to Abraham a tremendous covenant uh, that is, is one that obviously God honors all of these covenants. And it's interesting here, but the fulfillment won't take place until much, much later, but it takes place because God is faithful. The second covenant is the Davidic covenant. And uh, for scriptures that you might want to, to look at, 2 Samuel chapter 7 verses 10 through 16, uh, many places in scriptures we have a reference to David. And uh, when we talk about governance next week, we'll be referencing the Davidic covenant and talking about that. Uh, over in Isaiah, for instance, chapter 11. Isaiah is a, a fascinating book because there's a, a lot in it that actually pertains to the millennial kingdom. Uh, but in chapter 11, in verse 1, a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of... And he goes on, and he's talking here about Christ and the significance here. But it's interesting, it says there that he stem, comes from the stem of Jesse. And when you think of David and you think of the reality of this covenant, the throne of David, the throne of Solomon's kingdom uh, it is fully established. The, the throne here for David um, and his kingdom will not be taken away from him. The Solomon's kingdom, did that end? Yeah. Yeah. How about David's? No. Yeah. And, and there's a, a huge difference. So David's house, his throne, his kingdom, all will be established forever. <clears throat> so it's interesting, but God and his prophets, they realized that Solomon was not the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. All land, for instance, had not been possessed even. Solomon's uh, temporary overlordship is, is not an everlasting possession. So hundreds of years after Solomon reigns, the Bible is still packed with God's promises concerning the future possession of the land. And so that is going to take place. If you want some more scripture references, uh, let's see, I think Isaiah 33, let me just gaze at that. Uh, Isaiah 33, um, you just, if, you're, if you're looking for more, Ezekiel 34, verses 23 through 25. Micah 4, verses 7 and 8. I mentioned earlier, Jeremiah 20, 23, 5. Ezekiel 37, 24. I'll talk about David very prominently um, here in the scriptures. 
So we have the Abraham covenant, the Davidic covenant, and also the Palestinian covenant. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verses 1 through 10 are going to reference uh, this, along with some other scriptures as well. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 28 and 29. And also chapter 39, verse 28. 37 and 26. Let me just back up. I'll, I'll read verse 25. They will live on the land that I gave to Jacob, my servant, in which your fathers live. They will live on it, they and their sons, and their sons' sons forever. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. I'll make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them. And will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place also will be with them. And I will be their God, and they will be my people. And the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. So, pretty neat promise there for uh, the Palestinian covenant. And so, Israel will experience a future restoration. Uh, they will come back into the land. Israel will be converted uh, largely as a nation. And uh, the promises that were made in passages like this one here in Ezekiel uh, will be fulfilled during that period of time. Now, the, the last covenant there that I want to make mention of here is the new covenant. And uh, you can look in, in Jeremiah, for instance, <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 31, and verse 31, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and on their heart, and I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. It's very easy. You could read through that passage and, uh, and it becomes one of those flyover passages. You know, when you're reading your devotions, you just kind of get there and it sounds nice. But think about that in the application here for the millennial kingdom. Because this is what it's talking about. It's talking about a time when God says they are going to have a new heart. This is going to be a, a new people. Their hearts are going to be converted to the degree that people will not say to their neighbor that you should know the Lord. Because they're all going to know the Lord. How would you like to live during a period of time like that? There's no need to witness. Everybody knows is safe. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? So that's the condition of the millennial kingdom. In fact, every single person that goes into the millennial kingdom is a believer. Isn't that great? That's pretty neat. It's not even heaven yet. It's not going to consider that. But it's a wonderful time. And it's pretty phenomenal. So they're going to have a converted heart. Uh, there's going to be uh, the forgiveness of sin. The promise is there. The promise of restoration to the favor and blessing of God. They're going to be the recipients of the blessing of God. Uh, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit uh, will be a big part of this new nation. And so these things that we're reading here in Jeremiah chapter 31 have never been fulfilled. They've never been fulfilled. The only place they're going to be fulfilled is in the kingdom here. And so, uh, again, a time of, of great rejoicing. The relation of Satan to the millennium, uh, let me just say this. We'll kind of skip over that one here. The relation of Satan. Satan is cast into the abyss, as I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> in his days, Jeremiah 23, 6 says, In his days, Judah will be saved. And uh, they're going to be calling the Lord, uh, the Lord our righteous. Uh, Satan is going to be taken out of the way. And that is going to be a huge, 
huge difference maker uh, during the time of the Millennial Kingdom. Uh, we, we fail to understand, I don't think any one of us understands the level of uh, influence that Satan has on our societies today uh, and the world. Uh, he is very, very active. Uh, but not only uh, you know, is, is Satan pushed aside, uh, but the demons and everything else. I mean, we're living in a world here where everyone who comes into this world is a believer. They are going to have many, many children. And some of those children will not be believers. Uh, but they will adhere to a standard of, of righteousness. In other words, they will have to do what is right. We'll, we'll find out more about that as we, we kind of go through it and flesh it out. But Satan is, is totally uh, off of the uh, screen, as it were, until the very end of the tribulation. And he is loose from the abyss. And then we'll, uh, we'll talk about the significance of that here in a little bit. <clears throat> Another big portion of doctrine when it comes to uh, the millennial kingdom is the manifestation of Jesus Christ in the millennial kingdom. Uh, there are so many scriptures here that deal with the ministries and manifestations associated with Jesus and the second coming. Uh, one, one aspect is he's going to be manifested as the son of David. Uh, the scriptures tell us that, Luke 1, 32, 33, in which he's going to be the rightful heir to the throne. And he will assume the throne, and he'll reign there. He will be manifested as the son of man as well. And that means uh, he's going to execute judgment at the inception of the kingdom, and also throughout the age. Now, what's interesting is, one of the attributes that we talked about last Sunday was what? The righteousness of God, whereby God always acts, and he does what is right. He always is just. And this is the character of, of God in the person of Jesus as well. Uh, uh, Jesus is God as the Father and the Holy Spirit is God. And uh, as he acts and rules, he will rule with absolute justice. And that's a big difference from what the world is seeing. And we can look around the world today and we can point out the injustices in the world, can't we? But one of the things that the prophets will talk about is just how unjust people have become. Even religious leaders are called out uh, among the prophets in their writing for being unjust. And so the world is really upside down. By the time Jesus Christ comes back, it's a real strong contrast to what has been going on in the world. So he's manifested uh, many different ways as God's theocratic king. Um, he's going to be the king of righteousness. He's the king over Israel, John 12, 13. He'll be the king of kings, Revelation 19, 16. King over all the earth, Zechariah 14, 9. He's manifested as God the Son. So with all of this, um, and that's just really, really kind of the, the tip of the, the iceberg. Um, he's the redeemer. He is the judge, rewarder of the saints, teacher, prophet, lawgiver, shepherd. The millennium, if you want to take a note, the millennium will be the period of a full manifestation of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will finally receive what is due him. All the world will be bringing him glory. Isn't that great? Irony here? That's exactly what the devil wanted. That is exactly what Satan craved. And Satan never really obtains that. Even though he has the, the mark and people have to buy and sell, he, he still has opposition. The whole world is... is you know, there's still people bucking the trend. There's still people who refuse the mark. I mean, he never fully gets the whole planet behind him. And here is Jesus, and he is on the throne, ruling and reigning. All of us that are there, the church is, is, is lending a, a, a part of this, but primarily these, these believers here who, who have not glorified bodies, but, but human bodies that are walking, they will be amazingly loyal to Jesus. And he will receive the glory that is, is due him. And uh, when we look at that, we see that this was a desire that God had from the very beginning, where he desired Adam and Eve to give him glory. And if they had been obedient, they would have been in a position to give him glory. But unfortunately, 
uh, we know, uh, again, what happened there. And so the manifestation of the glory that's associated with the deity of Christ um, in includes several things. Fascinatingly enough, the, his omniscience is recognized. Jesus is omniscience. That's Isaiah 66, verses 15 through 18. His omnipotence that sustains throughout the age is also recognized. Isaiah 41, 10, verses 17 and 18. Psalm 46, verse 1 and 5. He receives worship as God, and righteousness, the psalmist says, is fully manifested. Psalm 45, verse 4 and verse 7. If you want a scripture, if you're writing feverishly, your pen is running out of ink. Righteousness is fully manifested. There's also a full display of divine mercy coming from Jesus. Isaiah 63, verses 17 through 19. Isaiah 63, 7 through 19. In chapter 54, verses 7 through 10. Divine goodness, that's displayed in Jesus. <coughs> and get ready for this. Get ready for this? The holiness of God will be manifested through the Messiah. There will be, through the King, Jesus Christ, a full display of the divine attributes so that Christ might be glorified as God. <coughs> Isn't that cool? I thought that was really cool seeing that we're in a study on the attributes. Right now. And we're going through this. But here we are, during the Millennial Kingdom, all of the attributes of God are displayed in the person of Jesus Christ so that the world cannot miss the reality that Jesus is God. And doesn't that come down to the object of our faith, being Jesus the Christ, and thereby having forgiveness of sin? All of those things are part of who he is. You can't separate. When we do our study on Sunday morning, dealing with the attributes of God, are you like me in the sense that when you hear attributes of God, you immediately think of God the Father? Mm -hmm. All of those attributes are attributed to all three persons of the Trinity. Amen. All three. And we have it on display so that not a soul can miss it during the millennial kingdom. I think that's just Fantastic. All right. So, do you want to take a break or do you want to keep going a little bit longer? People up front are diehards. I know you guys in the back just said, let's get out of here. <laughs> and I fully respect that. I, I fully respect that. But these people up front just said, let's stay and, uh, and keep going. All right. So, we won't finish the notes tonight. How's that for the people <laughs> that want to go home? Uh, but we are going to tackle, let me see where it is on your notes here, the spiritual character of the millennium. All right, the, the A, B, C, D, and E. A, B, C, D, and E. The kingdom is characterized first by, or the first point here is by righteousness. Um, only the righteous are admitted to the kingdom. Uh, in Matthew 25, verse 37, it says, Then shall the righteous answer. Of Israel it's also written, Thy people shall be righteous. They shall inherit the land forever. Isaiah 60, verse 21. The Bible says in Isaiah 26, 2, The gates of Zion are open, that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. In the millennial kingdom, righteousness becomes synonymous with the Messiah. His name is shall the Son of Righteousness rise with healing in his wings. Do you remember that verse? That's Malachi 4.2. Malachi 4.2. Shall the Son, S-U-N, S-U-N, shall the Son of Righteousness rise with healing in his wings. And so it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about his righteousness. His righteousness is sometimes teamed up with the word peace. But because of the presence of Messiah, Jerusalem really becomes the source of all millennial righteousness. And it emanates from there. Now, why is that important? 
you're going to see uh, that as you look at the scriptures pertaining to the millennial kingdom, that Jerusalem uh, is known as the holy city. It is very much the epicenter of the world because that is where Jesus is and that is where he is ruling and reigning. So the presence of God in the person of Jesus Christ is in Jerusalem. And everything emanates out from that. There will be people ruling and reigning in different aspects around the globe. But all of that righteousness is emanating from Jerusalem where Jesus Christ is. And so righteousness becomes the descriptive, descriptive term that really characterizes the rule of Christ uh, during this period of time. And uh, make no, no mistake about it, it's going to be a lot different than the world we're living in today. Absolutely. Yeah, praise the Lord. So the second characteristic here is that of obedience. So one essential purpose of the original creation was to establish a kingdom where there was a complete and willing obedience on the part of the subject, man, to God who is holy. And disobedience obviously follows, but God does not surrender his purpose of bringing all things to subjection to himself. Now, I'm going to go back in the New Testament to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. So God had a purpose originally. And Paul references this here in verse 9 where he says, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the time. That is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having pre been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. God is going to bring all things into subjection to the one who said, I come to do thy will. That's, uh, and if you want another reference, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 9. So the doing of the will of God in the millennium will be helped by virtue of several different things. But understand this. God's desire in creating man was to have subjects who would become subject to him willingly through obedience. And that's what God wanted. And God received great glory every time his children are obedient. Now, we struggle with certain aspects to be obedient uh, to the Lord today. During the millennial kingdom, though, think of this. Uh, Israel is going to restore, re ex really experience a renewed heart and mind. Uh, and they'll have God's law in their hearts. Jeremiah 31, 33. They'll have God's law in their heart. Uh, it's not going to be an external observation of rules and regulations. That's been the problem for many, hasn't it? That's not what God's interested in. God is interested in a willing heart. And this is exactly what's going to happen, whereby the Jewish people have the law of God written on their heart, and they're desiring to be compliant. Number two, it's a little bit easier during the millennial kingdom to obey the Lord because the Holy Spirit is poured upon all flesh. He's indwelling them, filling them, and teaching them. And you and I have knowledge of the understanding that we have the Holy Spirit today. We know the blessings of having the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will be very active during the millennial kingdom. Very active. In fact, I, I, I've read certain people who have said he's more active during the millennial kingdom than at any other time in the history of the world. So I, I found that to be a pretty interesting point. Satan will be bound. Even evil doers will be cut off. Uh, during the millennial kingdom. That's going to help people be obedient to the Lord. Right? Uh, the wickedness is not going to be tolerated during this period of time. What's it saying, Corinthians? Bad company corrupts good morals. Right? Yeah. There, there's not going to be any of that. If someone is 
not walking with God, God is going to judge them. That's the whole purpose of the ruling and reigning with Christ aspect. And so these people will be, the wicked will be cut off. Uh, and so wickedness never gets a foothold uh, at all. Universal knowledge of the Lord will eliminate the inadvertent opposition to God's will through ignorance as well. Uh, there won't be those who are walking in ignorance disobeying the Lord. Uh, there's going to be an understanding that this is the will of the Lord. Isn't that great? That is just great. So I'm excited about, about that part of it as well. That's the part there dealing with the obedience. Now, the third aspect is holiness. Uh, holiness is a, a huge part. In fact, I will tell you right now, and, and those of you who are anxious to leave, you're happy. Uh, there are so many scriptures we're not even going to be able to tackle. Really, like, <laughs> the there are so many scriptures that apply uh, to the millennial kingdom that deal with the subject of holiness. It is, without a doubt, part of the overall purpose of God to manifest holiness in his creatures, his people, during the kingdom age. Uh, very important uh, very important point. Uh, holiness will be the great distinguishing characteristic of the Jewish people in all categories of their national life. A holiness that's not their own, but is imparted to them through Jesus Christ. So what we see during this period of time is that holiness will be much more the norm. The Lord will exalt his holy mountain, Jerusalem. Psalm 48, 1 tells us that. Jeremiah 31, 23 tells us that. He will establish his holy house, the law of which shall be holiness. Christ will reign over the nations of the earth from the throne of his holiness. That's Psalm chapter 47, verses 8 and 9. And so we find that, that according to the holy oath that sealed the Davidic covenant, the priests are going to teach the people the difference between the holy and the profane. You might read about that in Ezekiel 44, verse 23 where the, the priests are teaching the people the difference. And they're going to appear before Jesus in holy array, Psalm 110, verse 3. And I like this. This is a, a verse. You have to write this reference down. Zechariah 14, 20 and 21. In that day, upon the bells of the horses will be inscribed, Holiness unto the Lord. And all the pots in Jerusalem and Judah shall be just as holy as the sacred vessels in the Lord's house. In other words, everything is holy unto God. Everything is holy unto God. And this is a really holy kingdom. I mean, this is holy. Uh, it's something that we, we have never experienced before, uh, quite honestly. Uh, but this is a characteristic of this time period. Uh, again, so if you are wicked and you demonstrate wickedness, you are going to stand out like a sore thumb. You really, really are. The last point here is the kingdom characterized is characterized by truth. Um, we understand that over in Romans chapter 1, uh, judgment came because men changed the truth of God into a lie. Uh, there is going to be a full manifestation of truth in the millennial kingdom. Uh, Jesus Christ will rule and reign with, with truth at the forefront, um, and truth will triumph uh, through Jesus Christ. And it, it will be very, very different uh, than the time period that we live in today. Last but not least, the kingdom characterized by the fullness of the Holy Spirit. In Joel chapter 2, and verse 28 and 29, it says that it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days will I pour out my spirit. Now that's a passage there in Joel chapter 2. It is oftentimes applied to various different times and places. And you may hear that applied to Christianity today. I forget where I was. I was someplace, and it says, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And 
They asked me if I saw a, had a dream or saw a vision, depending on how old or young I was. So it depends what category. So if you're old, you dream. If you're young, you see visions, right? <laughs> so, Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> this passage of scripture is actually pertaining to kingdom time. It's actually a, applying itself to the millennial kingdom. It's important to note that. Uh, prophecies, uh, picturing the millennium, uh, John Walter writes, he says, unite in their testimony that the work of the Holy Spirit in believers will be more abundant and have greater manifestation in the millennium than in any previous dispensation. John Walbert said it, that's uh, right? <laughs> But notice all the scriptures, if you want to write down some verses. Ezekiel chapter 37 and verse 14. It says there, I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will place you in your own land. The filling of the Holy Spirit is going to be very common in contrast to the time period the people of Israel in the Old Testament where at times we had the Spirit of God indwelling people, but it was not normative as it is from the time of Pentecost to the rapture. The church age saints all are baptized into the body of Christ, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and receive the Holy Spirit of God. We're baptized by the Spirit of the Lord into the body of Christ, and so we receive the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit today if you are a born-again believer. That could not be said of every person during the Old Testament time period, where the indwelling was for a very special time and purpose, very, very distinct. Jesus said uh, that I'm going to have to leave so that you all can receive the comforter. And the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God is an enormously important ministry. Uh, Jesus Christ ministered to many, many people. But think about the Holy Spirit of God who indwells our brothers and sisters in Christ all the way around the world and does the same thing in their heart that he does in our heart. Isn't that amazing? And the Holy Spirit of God is very, very active today. And uh, you're going to see differences in the tribulation, and that's a whole other study really of itself where you would study the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But by the time you come here to the millennial kingdom, you have the Holy Spirit once again poured out upon the people of Israel. And uh, it, it's an exciting time for them um, for, for that reason, uh, when you stop and, and you think about it. Um, oftentimes, if you think about us today, what keeps us from being filled with the Holy Spirit? Galatians says, tells us what it is. What's the problem that we have? Our flesh, right? Our flesh, and the deeds of the flesh are these things, and the contrast to the fruit of the Spirit. He talks about walking in the Spirit so we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And he goes on and he talks about being controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. During the Millennial Kingdom, uh, there will be, uh, between the Holy Spirit of God and the fact that Jesus Christ, and you have this theocratic kingdom, and you have uh, total knowledge of what is right and wrong. I'll tell you what, I can't wait for that. I want to see that play out. You know, right now, they twist everything in knots, don't they? Things that are absolutely sin are trying to be made into being, you know, to put the lipstick on the pig thing. And, you know, here it is. It's fine. And, and there's no one that's going to, to not understand what is right and what is wrong during this period of time. Uh, and, and so, again, you don't have people, I should say that, let me say, say it this way. You're not dragging anybody else down. <laughs> I was going to say, you don't have people dragging you down, but that'd be high lobby. Uh, I'm not dragging anybody else down. And uh, you have this great time period where I believe that there will be people whose uh, walk with the Lord will be very, very deep and significant, and they will have the power of the Holy Spirit of God uh, working in and through them. So this is a, a time where the Holy Spirit is really uh, transforming lives again, and, and uh, you see this, this ministry just blossoming, and uh, it's, it's pretty exciting. So... Uh, those are the characteristics here that I wanted to cover. There's a whole list of things. There's a whole bunch of things. They start with an A and they go down to what? Uh, w. Person. And so uh, those are all different things that are happening um, as part of changes in the millennial kingdom. Uh, some of them involve animals. Animals. Uh, the curse that was placed upon the earth back in Genesis is going to be lifted. 
What do you think of that? that that's pretty exciting. And uh, now, I'll give you a little homework. I'll give you a little homework. You up for homework? I want you to find me the verse. I want you to find me the verse of Scripture. It says the lion will lay down with the... Uh, find that for me next week, will you? Write that down before we start. Find that verse of Scripture. That'll be good. All right. Let's have a word of prayer. You'd be great. Thank you for putting up with this. <laughs> Father, we thank you for the promises that we've studied here tonight. And Lord, uh, we realize that this world, uh, there, there's some amazing events going to take place. Uh, Father, we are privileged when we read the passage uh, to know that we will be part of your future plan uh, because we're part of the first resurrection. Lord, we recognize it's not something that we've done, but it's really your grace and mercy that has made this possible. So bless, Father, uh, as, as we leave this study, Father, help us to, to grab a hold of certain things that will help us in our daily walk with you. Uh, may some of the things that we've, we've gone over tonight uh, really uh, be things that we can think upon and meditate upon, Lord. And uh, may you just be glorified by your children here tonight, I pray. Give us safety as we go our separate ways, Lord, here tonight, I pray. And give us a great remainder of this week. In Jesus' name.